Welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast, your home for weekly information and inspiration to help you get the graduate job of your dreams. Welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast with your host, James Curran. The Graduate Job Podcast is your weekly home for all things related to helping you on your journey to finding that amazing job. Each week I bring together the best minds in the industry, speaking to leading authors, entrepreneurs, coaches and bloggers who bring decades of experience into a bite-sized weekly 30-minute show. Put simply, this is a show I wish I had a decade ago when I graduated. And today for episode 59 of the Graduate Job Podcast, I'm rejoined on the show by John Lees, best-selling author, career coach and all-round career expert as we delve into his new book, Knockout Interviews, and explore how you can succeed in your graduate job interview. In this half hour, we explore everything you need to know to succeed in a graduate job interview. We cover why you need to think about your goals of a job interview and why focusing on the four key pieces of information that you want to get across could set you apart from everybody else. We delve into how to answer the classic job interview questions you will face, top tips for answering graduate competency questions, and the different frameworks you can use to help answer them. If you have a telephone, face-to-face, or panel interview coming up anytime soon, then this is an episode which you aren't going to want to miss. As always, all links to everything we discuss and a full transcript are available in the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash knockout interview. Before we start, a quick request from me. Your feedback helps me to create the episode you want to hear. So I've set up a super simple and very quick survey as I want the show to best serve your needs. It's got five questions and it'll take you just a minute to do. So please check it out at graduatejobpodcast.com slash survey. I look forward to hearing your thoughts, but in the meantime, let's crack on with the show. Before we start, though, I want to welcome today's sponsor, which is CareerGym.com. CareerGym is the number one place for you to undertake all of your psychometric tests, which you will face when you apply for a graduate job. You can practice verbal, numerical and abstract reasoning tests, all produced by experts and exactly the same as the ones you will see in the real tests. You can just practice them or you can do them in exam mode under time pressure and they come all with a detailed explanations and solutions and you can track your progress and see how you compare against your peers. I've been recommending the site for years to the clients I coach and it comes very highly recommended. What's even better is if you use the code GJP, that's capital letters GJP for Graduate Job Podcast, you will get 20% off all of their tests. You can't say fairer than that. So head over to careergym.com, that's career and gym, G-Y-M, and use the code GJP to get 20% off and start practicing today. Now on with the show. A very warm welcome back to the show, a man who needs no introduction as he's been on this show twice before, the author of the brilliant How to Get a Job You Love and Knockout Interviews to name but a few, career coach and general career expert John Lees, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Great to be with you. And it's been uh, must be what, six months, John, since you were on the show last. What have you been up to uh, in over the last uh, six months? Well, one or two things, um, but uh, I suppose uh, the main thing we're focused on today is my latest book, which is called Knockout Interview, uh, which was published just at the end of uh, January this year. You know, we're gonna we're gonna go into detail for it today, but I've really enjoyed it. It's a it's a cracking book and i know there's um a lot of great content in there that graduates are gonna really really enjoy and hopefully we'll we'll bring some of that to the surface today so john before we maybe um we delve into the book let's uh let's think about interviews generally and uh what they are and i really like at the beginning of your book how you say that the questions you face in interviews are predictable. Uh, many people, when I've interviewed them, you know, you ask them questions and they just look flummoxed straight from the off mm. that, that you'd, you know, you'd ask them that question. But um, maybe if we start off with why you think questions are predictable. Why questions are predictable? Yeah, essentially because um, an interview is um, very time expensive and yet employers rely on them and they rely on them because they want to check out chemistry and they want to sort of see what you're like in the room so so in that sense an interview is like an audition or a screen test they really want to see what you look like and sound like so in other words they're going to happen so but there is 
uh, time for only a limited uh, exchange of information, isn't there? So uh, even a half smart interviewer knows that what they've got to really focus on is the questions which will uh, get to um, information which is likely to predict your job performance. So if you know that, then you know that the majority of questions, and I always say it's about 80% of questions, are going to be focused on the things that really matter in terms of trying to work out in that short period of time when you're in the room whether you can actually do the job. And that's not everything in the job. It's probably something more like the top six or eight skills, bits of experience, competences that you are going to have to deliver. I like that. That's in that's entirely true, and it's um, we're going to talk about interview preparation um, as we go through. But it's definitely something where if you do put the work in at the at the front end, then you know you really do get the benefits of it later on. So maybe starting though, what I uh, I liked is you discuss the three goals of interviewing, and this is something that I've not not seen before, but it really resonated with me. Could you talk us through what those three goals of interviewing are and why they're important? So three goals, is, I mean, there are lots of goals in the interview, but I, I think the three goals that a candidate wants to achieve um, are about, you know, thinking about what, what are the, the major boxes you want to get ticked early on in the process. And the first goal is that you want to show that you're easy to talk to because the interviewer can then relax and think this is going to be a, a pleasant experience, but also subconsciously thinking this is going to be an easy person to work with. The second thing is that you've got to cover the ground, as I'd say. You've got to make sure that you are hitting uh, all of the boxes in somebody's checklist. And there's different ways of doing that. And one of them is to think about the length of your answers. And I hope we get a chance to talk about that this morning. And the third one is to show that you fit. So it's what I said before. It's thinking of a job interview as being much more like a screen test than anything else. That what somebody's doing is they're actually not paying a huge amount of attention, I think, to the content of your questions, but they're thinking: Does this person look right? Sound right? Will I be embarrassed when I introduce this person as a new member of the team? Uh, can I take this person along on a customer visit? So that's the thing that's really going on. So those three things are really good starting points because we all try and hold a, a thousand and one pieces of information in our heads when we go into a job interview. But if you're asking yourself, well, can I make this an easy experience for the interviewer? Can I make sure that my evidence, if you like, covers the, the ground as far as the, the job content is concerned? And thirdly, can I just for, you know, make sure that I look and sound the part? Then that's, that's actually already an above average interview performance. I mean, I think that's one of the things I really want to say is that you don't have to put thousands of hours into this. A small amount of focused effort already takes an interview performance into uh, the above average category. Yeah. And uh, when I was doing interviews, uh, the question that I always had at the back of my mind, as you mentioned, was, can I see myself working with this person? Um, at yeah. the time, I was working for a consultancy and we'd often spend months working in, um, you know, away from home. Uh, you're living in hotels with these people. You know, you're working with them during the day. You're in the same hotel with them in the evening, probably eating together meals in the evening. So you need to be able to get on with people. So it was a mm. you know, fundamental question. Would I want to spend that much time with that person was uh, the thought that was always at the back of my head. Yeah. Yep. And the first point you talked about there in the goal uh, was, you know, to be easy to talk to. And uh, you talk in the book about just why informal chat is important. And, mm. uh, you know, this is, you know, small talk is a, is a skill that it's, it's uh, good to have. And it's you know, often mm. seen in one of the, the early questions such as, um, did you have any problem finding us today? And mm. you know, how can, uh, why mm. is informal chat uh, just so important? And, you know, how can people begin to um, demonstrate it in easy early questions like, you know, how did you find us today? Yeah, well, there's a misunderstanding, I think, and you'll hear a lot of people say that an interviewer makes up uh, his or her mind about you in the first 30 seconds. And that isn't entirely true because they don't have any substantial information to get hold of. They, they probably don't really know 
about your skills and your experience at that point. But what they have judged in that first few seconds is, is this person easy to talk to? Can I see them as a potential colleague? And um, do they look and sound the part as well? It is a sort of an audition going on as well. So small talk is part of that. And I think the mistake that people make is to believe that that's purely about instinctive behaviours. So either you're a naturally a relaxed and chatty person uh, or you're not. And of course, like many of these things, they are learned behaviours. So it is actually something you can practice if, if you don't find small talk easy or even uh, more commonly, some people find it pointless. They, they don't actually see it leads to anything. So you just practice it and you practice it when you're in the supermarket, you practice it when you go and buy your paper in the shop. You know, there's just lots of contexts where you could just spend 30 seconds uh, talking to somebody about the day or traffic or any of those things just gets you into that gear that says how do you sound uh, relatively confident and relaxed uh, and you're just not really talking about anything terribly important taxi drivers are always a good one to practice on you know uh, <laughs> yes true. they always uh, love a good chat so uh, next time you're having an uber then um, yeah ask the driver how his day's going or how long he's been working and then you can yeah. you can go from there well, um, you made a good point there, which is that ask questions too. So people often think small talk is what you say in reply, but sometimes asking questions like, you know, how long has this building been built or this looks great, you know, how long have you been doing this? That's also, small talk is also about the questions that you throw in and the curiosity that you demonstrate. Yep. And then with the, um, it's going back to the, then in the initial question you might get of such as, uh, did you have any problems finding us or you know how's your you know uh, how's your day going or something like that um yeah. what advice would you give people about how to how to answer that in a in a positive way well again because they these fall into the kind of category of the 80% of questions that are, are going to come up then <laughs> what i would say again is think about the opportunities to just uh try out answers to that and that sometimes means getting a good friend to uh, give you a dummy interview um, because um, it, in a sense it doesn't really matter what you say it's like the last question on 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 question time on television when the you know the politicians have had a good hour of haranguing each other and the, the final question of the evening is often much more lightweight one uh, and the ones to the people who respond best to that um, what they're doing is actually demonstrating um, a light touch and sense of humour and uh, just the sort of human side to them. So again, what what you say there is far less important than the way you say it. Yeah, I often found this was a really good uh, indicator of how the interview would go with, um, you know, because if people would answer in a you know a positive, upbeat way, uh, then you, you might have a good interview. Whereas sometimes you get people and you'd ask them how they're you know how they got there if they got there okay and then they'd they start moaning about the traffic or the tube was late and the train was yeah. late and you think well to a certain extent yeah. they don't really care you know it's your job to be there on time and just uh answer it in a upbeat way just to get it going get it the really off matters. on a good foot yeah it really matters uh, and so the two mistakes one is being negative and the other is not saying very much because that is an invitation when somebody says to you what's the traffic like this morning uh, that is an invitation. It's a warm invitation to to say let's let's begin a conversation. And you, uh, you're you're a guest here, but we really like to get to know you a little bit better. So what have you got to say for yourself? So um, it, nobody should be surprised by that moment. Uh, just as nobody should be surprised by some of the standard questions that I cover in my book. Simply because um, you know interviewers do not sit down at the beginning of a day and think right how can I invent a totally new question or a totally new approach they're going to wheel out the standard questions and the standard interview structures so you might as well be, be prepared for the predictable. Yep. So thinking then about the preparation, how should people begin to to think about the prep for an interview? So I'm guessing ideally it shouldn't be the day before. You know, you're talking weeks before um, or even before you know you actually if you've got the interview lined up to start thinking about what it is you want to talk about. Sure. Well, I think, you know, obviously you've got to do a fair amount of preparation just to get shortlisted. And that could be about filling in online forms or adjusting your CV. Um, if you're called for interview, that's a fantastic buying signal because it means that you've been selected out of a, a larger 
pack into a small body of people that look as if they may be able to do the job. Um, the preparation that people do there really focuses on a few key areas. One is to discover as much about the organization as you think might be relevant in the process. And I say it that way rather than saying, uh, find out everything you can, because everything you can about an organization, that, that could take you months, but focusing on things that could matter in the process. Now, when employers talk about graduate interviews, one of the things they say is that, yes, the, the people we interview have looked at our website and then all they do is kind of parrot phrases that they've seen on the website. Now, that's a rather poor signal because it says they've just maybe spent 10 minutes and they've absorbed some key phrases without really understanding them. So you've got to do more than that. You've got to look around for a broader range of research tools, other kinds of websites. The ideal tool, of course, is to talk to somebody who already works at the organization or has worked there or has done consultancy where there or an internship or anything like that. And this is where um, alumni associations are really helpful because all you're doing is gathering information. You're not saying I want extra leverage or tell me how to trick my way through this process or get special consideration. I mean, th those things really don't work. But you are saying I'm talking to this organization. I'm really excited about it. I'd love to know more about what their current areas of focus are, um, how are they changing, where are they heading, what kind of people do well in the organization. And I, I'd like to say that even just one conversation with somebody that can give you a human perspective, it provides a fantastic shortcut because essentially somebody is going to say rather than trying to absorb 50,000 words, what you really know, need to know is these two or three things about this is where the organization is uh, going at the moment and this is what they find valuable in terms of candidates yeah i echo that it's such a powerful tool and uh, through linkedin it's so easy to do now using their alumni finder um just to find um people who've went to your university who work there or your your career service often have a list of people you know former uh, students and where they're working so tap into those through the career service and if you can speak to people it's um it's just so useful when they do ask you the question of why you want to work there and you go oh well you know I spoke with Bob who's on your graduate scheme at the moment and he said it was really exciting and mm -hmm. blah, blah 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 just to be able to say that just gives you such a tick in the box over people who've not done the research and are just regurgitating the information off the website like you said mm -hmm. I agree and actually listeners check out uh, my former interviews uh, with John where we go into more detail about how to utilize the alumni service which is at uh, graduatejobpodcast.com slash success so john moving on to maybe some of the areas where people under prepare and mm. also what stops them from preparing properly what uh, where do people tend to let themselves down in terms of their preparation it's a great question because the big puzzle to somebody like me um who i mean i've been working with people going to job interviews and who are people who are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, even 60s. And I can tell you, people in every one of those generations um, fail to prepare. So it's not to do with lack of experience or naivety or laziness. I think genuinely it is uh, it's either because people really don't have the tools, if you like, to decode what the experience is about, or they don't want to. And and that we have to respect that because visualizing the experience is something which is um, a little bit terrifying. But if you, if you can get hold of that a little bit and think, well, actually, it is potentially an hour in front of people and that hour is going to have a huge impact on my career uh, if I'm offered the job. or And if I'm not offered the job, it's still going to have a huge impact in terms of my confidence and performance levels. Then surely, you know, logically you think, well, I've, the, any amount of preparation to make that one hour experience work, it's got to be vital. And I have to say the great strategy is that people make it up when they get there, which is not a strategy at all. It's a, it's a recipe for uh, failure because as soon as you're doing that, your focus is internal. You're trying to think of good examples. You're worrying about what you're saying. If you're well prepared, your focus is on the relationship with the people in the room. So one example I have, John, where I was underprepared for an interview, um, I applied for a graduate job and uh, they got back in touch with me and said that the specific role that I'd applied for was uh, was full, but they had uh, some spaces in a 
in a different scheme. So I'd applied for a, a consulting role and they had one in the uh, technology consulting. So it was very IT focused and uh, it wasn't sort of my area of interest, but they had an opportunity for an interview in two days time in London. So I, I popped down for it and um, I was underprepared for it. I was frantically looking at Wikipedia on the way down, trying to get my head around some of the terms. And in the interview itself, the problem I had, it started to go badly. And then, of course, you, when you know that you've answered some questions badly at the back of your head, you're just thinking, oh, dear, I didn't answer that well. And then the other questions, you know, you sort of you're half just thinking about how badly the interview is going. And then it just <laughs> spirals out of control from there. And um, it's difficult to regain control sometimes when you when you lose it. it yeah, it is. But again, it's something which can be coached because one of the things you can do with people is to help them have more control of the process. So two two examples I can give you. One is to say, uh, don't worry about um, uh, the question you just answered, other than to think, is there a piece of information that I haven't communicated? Because if there is, you can come back to that at the end of the interview. But if you are, if you're constantly thinking, I didn't answer that well, that's your attention is on what you were doing two minutes ago <laughs> and yep. it's it's rather a formula one drivers don't think about the last bend you know <laughs> they're, they're constantly saying where am i now and uh, what do i need to focus on right now and it is strangely enough it is a discipline you can give to people uh, fairly quickly uh, and the other thing about control is to go into an interview with a short list of the pieces of information you do want to get across. Now, I'm not talking about 18 or 20. I'm talking about maybe three or four key messages about your experience and just make sure that you get them across, even if it's right at the end when they say, is there anything you'd like to add? Yep, no, that's a really good point. And again, going back to the goals we talked about earlier is to think, you know, before the interview about what the, you know, what the goals you want to get out are and the key things you want yep. to get across. So maybe if we move on to the specific questions uh, that graduates are likely to face then, John. So one of the early ones which comes up in pretty much every interview in uh, in one form or the other, and is one that you really shouldn't fail on, is how much do you know about us? Yes, that's right. And the reason that employers ask that, by the way, is that even during uh, even during the depth of the recession, employers were still saying we are seeing an awful lot of candidates that clearly don't really understand what we do and don't have anything to say about how they can match what we need. Now, those are two major flaws, aren't they? Because if you if you present as that rather like that candidate on The Apprentice when Alan Sugar said, well, you know, what do you know about the organization? And he said, very little indeed. That just demonstrates a complete lack of interest and motivation. Um, and there's l much smarter switched on candidates out there. So it's part of the psychological contract of an interview that you need to present as if this organization is your number one objective. It doesn't have to be in reality, but that's that's not the point. It's, it's rather like saying, while I'm here in the room with you today, this is the one thing that really interests me. Um, and how do you do that? Well, one shortcut is don't just look at the graduate recruitment pages of the website. Look at the media uh, section. Look at the press releases that the organization has been putting out for the last uh, couple of months and some of the more exciting press stories, because that's the sort of thing that you would do if you were really, really interested. As if it if it was the kind of money, so kind of, if it was the kind of organisation where you were going to invest your own savings, that's the sort of research you'd be doing, and that's what I would recommend to job candidates. Mm -hmm. Now that's uh, really good advice. And going back to the point we made earlier about if you can speak to people who work there or have worked there, again, it just allows you to um, add a bit more depth to uh, you know what you do know about the company. Mm. So moving on, John, uh, another one that uh, specifically graduates uh, might face is a question, why did you study that subject? Um, how can people handle this? Well, if you think about it, um, that's, first of all, it, it's the primary piece of information that you're presenting to an employer. If it's the average graduate CV, then the majority, um, the, the big focus is on this is what I'm studying right now or this is what I have just 
finished studying. Now, that, there's a tip in there, by the way, which is to say that if you've got work experience and you've got skills, um, put those on the first page of your CV um, before you go into details of, about your studies, because employers generally more interested in that. Once they once they understand that you've got a degree and that they know roughly what subject area it is, they quickly want to move on to well, what can you do? Um, so. But bearing in mind that that's the that's kind of your opening salvo is to say I have a degree in this subject, then um, an employer almost has not very little else to get hold of. I mean, yes, they'll move on later on to talk about um, more details, but but you're trying to help them solve a puzzle, which is how do I make any kind of useful connection between this uh, possibly quite abstract area of work uh, of study to the world of work because very few uh, degrees translate easily and absolutely into the workplace. Some translate much more easily than others, I get that, and we all get that, um, but those are the ones that are much easier if you've got a, if you've studied a very specific technical thing and that's the thing that the employer wants and that's a very easy conversation. But for 90 odd percent of graduates, they have to do some explaining, translating. And I'd like to say, James, that's not just about information. It's not just about unpacking the course. It's also, also about communicating motivation. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of graduate employers tell me that, you know, what students sound like they're saying is, um, I studied this because I couldn't think of anything else, or it was kind of recommended to me, but I didn't, I never got really excited about it. Well, if you think of this as an audition, that's how you come across uh, in terms of that seems to predict how you will be uh, when you're faced with the ideas and the disciplines and so on in, in work. How would you um, handle it? So, I mean, several people have got in touch recently and um, facing the challenge of wanting to move to a completely different area of focus from their, from their um, degree subject. So, I don't know, for example, from chemistry to say law, uh, or you know, just something that's a complete sort of 180 degree turn. Yeah. How can you, how can you l nicely link what you've studied, and then to something completely random or some something completely <laughs> different? Yeah. Um, probably worth saying to start with that that applies to a considerable number of people. Um, if you think about it, there's a wide range of degree subjects available and an even wider range of uh, job types available. So every week of the year, people are having that conversation that says, I don't quite fit or my experience or my qualifications might look a little strange to you. So the skill we learn is the skill of translation, which is not apologizing. It's not saying I've done something a bit different and I'm sorry about that, uh, but I've got potential, which is a very weak signal. The stronger signal says um, I've got unusual background or experience or I've done things that maybe some of your other uh, applicants haven't done. Or let me tell you why what I've been studying could be quite useful and helpful to you. So it's it's always thinking about what Where's the positive in this? What can you do that uh, communicates value to an organization? It even works quite well to say, I expect you think my degree has nothing to do with this job or there is no possible connection. Let me tell you why I think there is. Um, and you can even turn it into an advantage. So let's, you know, if you were, let's say, somebody with a chemistry background trying to retrain in law, you'd be talking about specific skills and areas of knowledge that the average law student wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good exam uh, example. And, you know, there's so many transferable skills from any degree, from the research, from the being able to present ideas from your writing and um, working in teams, depending on the course you did. So there's always things you can you can take from one situation to another if you just look hard enough and put the thought and attention in there. I agree. So maybe another question that uh, graduates might face, um, specifically if they've uh, maybe done some travelling, there appears to be a gap in your CV. You know, what were you doing? What would be a good approach for for answering this? 
Yeah, well, it, this must fall into the category of um, so highly predictable, you know, you really should not be uh, in any sense surprised if it comes up, just in the same way as if you switched uh, subjects halfway through a degree course, uh, or if you um, came to study late, or if you didn't finish a qualification, or as we've just been saying, you've got a qualification which is outside the normal range of what candidates have. Um, preparing information around these difficult areas is one of the most important bits of preparation that you can do. It is energy well spent, because if you can um, prepare a short upbeat and clear uh, answer that covers a particular CV moment, then you are again putting in an above average performance. So a, a gap year or a gap in a CV, or, then really got to be quite careful about that. You shouldn't sound as if you're inventing the answer while you're in the room, because that really shows that you haven't thought about your career story, you haven't thought about uh, where your career is heading. If you've taken a gap year, for example, do talk about how you planned it and why you planned it and what you got out of it and what you learned from it, and then talk about how you were really interested in, in using those skills in the world of work, because otherwise it could sound like uh, all you're doing is trying to work for another six months, save some money and go off traveling again. So employers are really tuned into what do we get out of this uh, and what what should we what should we be worried about here? That's, uh, that's great advice. Moving on then, John, another perennial question. What are your strengths? How can you handle this one without sounding arrogant? I think it really depends on your style. And so rather like talking about yourself in a networking context, the way we would coach candidates on this is to say you've got to find a language which is authentic for you. Now some people can actually get away with uh, phrases which in other people's mouths would sound like a complete ego trip. But if, you're, if you've got a kind of uh, jokey confidence you can say well I think I'm really good at this uh, and my strengths are this and people tell me I'm good at this. Now quieter candidates find that sort of language really difficult and if they if they use it, it comes out wrong. It comes out shallow and empty and unconvincing. So the thing not to do is then to think, well, I, I can't put in this bravado egotistical performance, so I won't prepare anything. Um, it's much better to think about uh, how are you going to present that evidence in a way that you find comfortable, but an employer also hears the evidence. So as I said, one of the phrases sometimes is that people tell me this or I've had feedback. A great way into this is, is to start of a sentence by using the phrase I really enjoy or I get a buzz out of. Because rather than saying I'm, I'm brilliant at this, what you're doing is saying this stuff really motivates me and interests me. So a much easier way in is, is to, when somebody asks you about your strengths, you can talk about the activities at work that you that you really get a buzz out of and you feel you get some good results. No, that's, a, that's a really nice way to do it. And conversely, if you get asked about your strengths, you're probably going to be asked uh, about your weaknesses. So this is a uh, this is a difficult one. I can remember coming up with some pat answers when I was um, doing this one about, you know, trying to sort of make up some of the things that weren't really a weakness, but trying to make them sound like a weakness. So yeah. Yeah. how would you how would you recommend doing this one? I must admit, I've been thinking about this and I've come up with different approaches over the years. And um, there is a school of thought that says, well, what you do is you present a weakness, which is in fact a strength. So you say, so you say well, my weakness is I have a low tolerance of people that uh, have poor work standards or uh, who are unreliable. That's just a bit too textbook. It's a bit too cliched. Um, clearly, one thing you're not going to do is to expose actual areas of vulnerability. You know, I don't really, I think I'm not very good at this, or I was reprimanded for this, or um, I always get this wrong. Um, the safest area is to talk about, um, uh, well, I'll give you two ways into it. One is to talk about areas for development. 
so you say, well, I know that uh, you know I'm pretty good at communicating with my team, but one thing I haven't done so well in the past is to follow up uh, with written communication. But I'm learning to do that, uh, and I made that a discipline, and I'm really focused on it. Or you can even talk about something where you're you're currently training or uh, in area of skill development, which is a very different message. Rather than saying um, I'm rubbish with Excel, you say um, I've recognised that's something important that I need to learn, so I've been uh, adding that to my list of learning objectives. Um, the other one is a bit cheekier, which is to say, um, well, I looked at things that you're looking for here, and uh, I think I can cover everything. And if there's any areas where um, I don't cover so well, well, I'm a very fast learner. <laughs> so that takes a little bit more confidence. But again, it's the sort of message that employers find realistic to hear because nobody comes completely pre-packaged, certainly not at graduate level. They, yep. they need to be people who are going to learn fast and get on with the job, but uh, have the confidence to say where they need support and where they need to focus on their own learning. Yep. I think uh, the one I settled on was um, I went for the area of development route. So this was after I come back from a year in China um, when I was applying for graduate jobs and I was learning Chinese at the time and I think I phrased it as I wasn't very good at languages but was looking to try and remedy this by uh, actively learning Chinese uh, mm. I think at the time just so that I could slot in one of my uh, sort of goals which was to you know bring in about my trip to China so yeah. I had sort of two two uh, dual roles so but it's a good point isn't there about how, how do you present this stuff if you if you start anything by saying I'm not really good at or I have a problem with that's a very different impact in the room to say um, I recognize an area where I need to improve um, because one is a much more negative message um, mm -hmm. beating yourself up doesn't work very well because we are all highly tuned to listen for negative information. So if you say something very negative about yourself or your last organization or even about the course you've just finished, that sticks in the mind and the interviewer is still processing that when you're talking about something completely different. Mm -hmm. Moving on then to other types of questions that are very common for graduates, the old competency questions. Um, so looking at one specific one um how do you dis how do you recommend people approaching well competency jet questions generally but also mm. you know specific examples such as can you take us through a time when you had mm. a complex problem to handle and mm. how did you do it yeah so graduates often think competency based questions are very easy because there's such a clear uh, cue in in it. Um, you've got the competency written out probably in your job description. Uh, the interviewer clearly has to uh, give you massive clues to point to this is the competency we are now discussing and the kind of lead-in question that you've just outlined, which usually starts, tell me about a time when you uh, demonstrated this particular competence. Um, whereas old school interviewing would say, um, talk me through that, that problem and let you flounder a bit and draw out the sort of competences from that. Now, it is only superficially easy because um, sometimes the rules of the game are, are that you only have one shot at the answer, particularly if it's a panel interview. So that means your answer has to convey a story which shows the competence used at the right level, uh, that it's related to the context of the job that you're going for uh, and covers all parts of the competence. And that's the bit that graduates often mi miss when you look at the statement of a competence. Um, it's usually quite wordy and it has lots of different elements to it. And that's where preparation comes in, because if you really only have one shot in a sort of four minute answer to cover all the bits of evidence that you need to communicate, then I'm afraid it is your responsibility to cover all parts of the competence. In other contexts, an, an interviewer will come back to you and say, well, tell me about this or give me a bit more information. But um, highly structured interviews, you may not get that opportunity at all. So it takes a lot more rehearsal and planning than most people think. Mm -hmm. And the, the common frameworks people use, such as a star uh, star technique, so the situation, task, mm. action and result, are, um, especially as you said, you, these competencies are flagged in advance. You know 
on their website they'll have a list of probably the the five competencies that they're looking at or the five values that they're looking at so you know that these if you've done the preparation you know that these questions are coming mm. and then it's easy to to think about a couple of answers for each of those questions and to and to plot them into a into a framework of um of how to answer them yeah but again one of the mistakes is to to answer in the, the same boring fashion that the question is posed um <laughs> competencies really do constrain interviewers they have to use something very close to a script that doesn't mean that candidates need to you can start your answer by saying well let me tell you uh, about a time when or that brings to mind uh, an experience you know you can have a much more chatty approach to it pointing directly to the story say a little bit about the context or the problem you're trying to solve and getting to the meat of what you actually did and that's why constructs like star are quite helpful because they give you a kind of internal um, structure to help you remember to talk about um, your contribution uh, but that you learn that very very fast and the main thing is actually to pre-prepare these pieces of narrative very very carefully try them out on other people rehearse them speak them out loud two or three times so that you know where the story ends and you know the right sort of phrases that you will be introducing. Mm -hmm. you know, somebody once said that interviewing, being interviewed is very much like stand-up comedy. And um, somebody uh, was interviewed recently on the radio saying that, you know, oh, why are you so good at this? And he said, well, it's basically it's delivering this for a thousand hours. It's a thousand hours of, of uh, delivering stand-up. You learn how to get the timing right. So we're not saying do a thousand hours of preparation for one interview, but we are recognizing that what you've got to do is to kind of imprint on your brain some of the material that you hope to be using successfully in the interview room. Yep, no, that's a great point. And uh, just bear in mind my um, the common bugbear I had with a competency question, especially when it's relating to a team, is um, make sure you you talk about what you did as opposed to what the team did. Remember, they're you know, they're hiring they're hiring you, they're not hiring the team. So don't be don't be shy about talking about specifically the the skills that you brought and uh, you know what you contributed. I agree. So just a couple more questions then, John. So one. Um, more random question the random question that occasionally is thrown in there the if you were a biscuit what sort of biscuit would you be <laughs> or if you were a, um animal you know in the jungle what would, yeah. what would you be how um how would you deal with these type of ones some of these questions are job related and some of them really aren't so a job related question might require you to um come up with uh, an instant calculation. So, how many how many light bulbs do you think there are in this building? That's a bit of rapid estimation based on common sense and knowledge. Um, wilder questions. Really, all they're doing is they're they're really just trying to see how you react when you're pushed slightly off balance. Now, in some contexts, that's highly appropriate, isn't it? You think about let's say somebody's going to go into a sales role or a customer interaction role you want to know how people are going to operate when the rule book isn't working and, and a customer reacts in a slightly different way or makes fun of you or makes a joke or involves you in some slightly wacky bit of conversation and of course the key thing there is maintaining a sense of humor so even if you can't think of an answer just if you say sit there saying i, I don't have an answer to that question what you've done is close down the relationship. It's much better to say that's a brilliant question and you must get some fantastic answers. Um, what's the best one you've ever had? Because, you know, people understand that not everybody has a kind of uh, an internal script that responds well to that kind of wacky stuff. But give it a go. You know, if it's something like, what well, if you're going to Mars, what three things would you take with you? Well, how, that is, strangely enough, a sort of predictable question because it starts to um, say, well, how do you think both logically and creatively uh, given a, a, an unexpected problem, uh, which is actually a very useful skill set? No, I completely agree. And uh, I like the uh, idea to, you know, if you do get one of those wacky ones to ask them, you know what the wackiest answer they've had just to, you know, to have the interaction and, it's and a bit cheeky but it buys you some time at least yeah so 
we've had the interview it's gone really well we've done the prep we've aced all the questions moving on to the important closing piece mm. so the piece that's going to stick in the interviewer's mind as you walk away a couple of uh you know the, the standard questions so firstly you know at the end of the interview when they ask you do you have any questions for us yeah i know again just going back to my previous experience i know when i had some questions but they weren't very good and i've just you know do you have any questions for us and i've been like oh no i think i've you've answered everything <laughs> and uh it, it just doesn't end on a very forceful uh note what would you recommend using here well we know that interviewers remember what you did at the beginning and what you did at the end of the interview more clearly than anything else so this clearly this moment matters and there is a great misunderstanding, which is repeated in a lot of advice to candidates that says this is a two-way process and you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. That is entirely incorrect. All you're doing in the process of an interview is doing your absolute best to be taken to the next level, whether that's second round or going to a job offer. If you've got serious questions about the organization or pay structures or learning possibilities, um, most of those are not appropriate in an interview room because they will easily sound like, I'm not sure, I've got doubts. And that's a really poor final message. A stronger message creates the idea that you are highly interested in the job and in fact you are helping the interviewer visualize yourself in the role. So if you talk about the future of the job, we talk about how the job will change, what learning opportunities you will have in the role, uh, how quickly you will be given responsibility, then actually this is back to the kind of screenplay idea that people are visualizing you actually doing the job. And let me tell you that once they've got a strong visual picture of you holding the post, that's quite difficult to shake. So most candidates, what they need is two or three questions like that. Now, you need two or three because something may already have come up. You may already have been given the information in the interview itself. So what it boils down to is maybe two questions. We're, again, focused on um, how the job will change, how it will grow, what you will do, um, how what you will be learning. Uh, and that really does have a much more positive impact. No, that's uh, that's brilliant advice. I'd um, I'd not thought it, thought of it like that before, but it makes complete sense. So, uh, listeners, some nuggets of gold for you there. So, John, I know we've uh, run slightly over time, but maybe just one final question before we go to the weekly staple questions. If you're asked, um, you know, is there anything you would like to add? What would you recommend here? Is this a chance for for candidates to to maybe what, go back over anything they didn't think they answered very well in the first place? That's a real judgment call. If you if a, if a question went not too well uh, and you bring the interviewer's attention back to it and add something which is fairly low key or not a terribly good additional piece of information, then all you've done is, is draw the interviewer's attention to the fact that one of the uh, questions was not well answered. So if you have in your back of your mind, these are the three or four key messages that I want to get across. Or uh, I can, thinking back to an earlier question, there was a one really useful piece of information that I could have added, then you could bring that into the room. And interestingly enough, if it's that important, you can also throw it in after the interview. You can, when you say thank you for the interview, you can, you can perhaps put a one-line email in to add. But it has to be a really important and really helpful piece of information. I think if you've put the major focus on the good questions that you have, you made sure that you've got your short hit list of questions of, of pieces of information across your three or four key messages then that's the point where you can say i really enjoyed this thank you very much i've got uh, nothing else to add at the moment excellent no that's uh again that's uh that's brilliant advice and um as you mentioned earlier you know they remember the the first and the last thing so you need to make sure that you end on a on a positive note quite right so john it's been uh a ton of brilliant information in there so let's move on to our, our weekly staple questions before we finish so it's um going to attack your well it's going to be a challenge for you now given that this is the the third time we're getting our answers so i'm looking for three pieces of new information so firstly what book would you recommend listeners uh, that they should read 
Okay, James, a book that I dip into from time to time, um, which may sound as if it's not particularly useful for graduates, but in fact, that's a real misunderstanding. It's a book by Michael Watkins called The First 90 Days, and it's published by Harvard Business School Press. It's a very readable book. And what it says is that um, people make their most important contribution not just to an organization but to their own careers in the first 90 days and that's true of staff at, at all level all levels because people uh, kind of make a, a fairly swift um, judgment about whether you're a long-term uh, high performer whether you're a star that likely to go well so if you think about when a graduate moves into the first few months of a, of a role, that is the moment actually where their contribution is most noticed and where key decision makers are thinking, yes, this is the kind of person we can see rising up the ladder, the sort of person we'd like to have with us in 10 years' time. So think this isn't just about kind of leaders and how they make an impact it's also about staff at every level thinking about what you do to make yourself visible within the first 90 days of any new job no, that's brilliant especially if you know the listeners have followed a followed the advice in the episode here and they've, they've aced the interview so they're, they're going to get the job offer so yeah it's um, you know important to then make sure you do make an impression in the first 90 days so that is a good one. I've um, not come across that myself, so it is one I'll add to my reading list. Great. And listeners, um, you can check out everything we've discussed today. A full transcript will be available in the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash knockout interview. And finally, John, what one tip can you give our listeners that they can implement today to help on their job search? The core tip, I think, which is at the heart not only of job interviews, but career success generally is to learn how to talk about yourself in a way that feels authentic and comfortable. And that applies in the opening moments of, a, of an interview when somebody says, tell us about yourself. Um, it applies when you're talking about your skills and your achievements, but it applies equally when you're having a conversation with uh, somebody at an event or uh, a member of the same alumni association and somebody just gives you that opening and says, well, tell me what you're looking for or tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, a bit of rehearsal, a bit of practice that allows you to get important pieces of information across uh, quietly, carefully, but, but authentically and effectively as well. That's the stuff that really matters. It's not the same as an elevator pitch because that can be very high octane and pushy. It's just learning to talk quietly uh, but effectively about yourself and practicing it before you get in front of decision makers. John, that's uh, that's great advice. And if you can, you know, if you can talk about yourself, then it'll it'll serve you well throughout your whole career. John, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you back on the show. What's the best way for listeners to to get in touch with you and all of your books? Oh, as always, just land it on our website, which is johnleescareers.com. Super. Cheers, John. Thank you so much for appearing on the Graduate Job Podcast. My pleasure. Thank you. Many thanks again to John Lees. Third time back on the show and you can understand why. So many nuggets of brilliant information there for you to take away and put to good use as you have your graduate job interviews. Make sure you check out the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash knockout interview. As you'll find a full transcript and links to John's brilliant book of the same name, Knockout Interview which you definitely need to read. So there you go, another episode completed. If you've enjoyed the episode or any of the other 58, you can thank me by completing my super short survey over at graduatejobpodcast.com slash survey. It will take you just two minutes to do, but it helps me to create the shows you want to hear. So get yourself over there now. Make sure you listen next week as I have a super episode with Sophie Milliken, former graduate recruiter at John Lewis, who shares some top tips which will help you get that graduate job. Make sure you don't miss that one. All that is left to say is I hope you enjoyed the episode today, but more importantly, I hope you use it and apply it. See you next week. <laughs>